Graceland, Graceland, when he asked her where she wanted to go on their 50th wedding anniversary, she did not hesitate. She said, Graceland. And because he had looked at that face for most of his life, he knew she was serious. And so the next week they were packing their bags to make a seven day round trip from San Antonio to Memphis, Tennessee. They were going to Graceland. <laughs> the two met 56 years ago. They met, of all places, in a cotton field in Minnesota. Their families, their families were uh, migrant farm workers, moved around uh, by agribusiness and corporate, and, uh, and corporate farms, also regulated by the INS and others. Uh, they, would start, they would start in North Texas uh, in the spring. They would go from there uh, as the weather changed to Kansas, then to Iowa, and then end up in Minnesota. Uh, Scott Kitayama, of course, whose family has farmed for generations on the border of Donna, Texas, will, told me the other day that um, there were so many kids that went to school with him that would arrive late in September because they had been working the fields up in the north. It's just a matter of course for them. Well, the boy's name was Raphael. He was 18. The girl's name was Ed Uvia, or she liked to go by uh, her anglicized name, Vicky. Vicky was 14. Both their families made their living by going, well, from big farm to big farm doing the picking. The first time Raphael looked across that field of white in Minnesota, he was stricken with a with a feeling he had never had before. And he was drawn to that girl by an irrepressible uh, uh, force. And so he looked forward to every year's rotation of going to North Texas and to Kansas and to Iowa and to Minnesota just to, to see her. As time went on, uh, they began, after they picked all day, they would be in the camp, of course, and they would sit together and they would talk. They, they would tell each other things that they had never told anyone before. Deep things. Deep things of the heart. I know what that feels like. After a year or two, he finally gathered up the courage to move his hand over and place it on hers. And he said when he touched her hand, he felt like electricity move through his entire body. A year or so later, when he stole a kiss, he said it was like a thunderbolt. <laughs> a thunderbolt came out of heaven, <laughs> almost knocked him to the ground. Since I kissed a girl in sixth grade, I know exactly what that feels like. I've been married to her for 47 years. <laughs> Still feels like that to me. Well, Vicky wasn't completely sure, being younger, about the advances of this boy. But, his, but her resistance was like a sandcastle <laughs> in the tidal waves of his love, and, and the castle just crumbled, and she finally really submitted to his love. Six years later, they were married. He was 24, she was 20. And he took all that love he had for her and he turned it into ambition for his family. And so he, he figured the best way he could make a living was, was driving one of those big rigs across country. And so he learned how to drive the Kenworths and the Peterbilts and he could really do it. And he drove from coast to coast. He made good money. He worked hard, but he made good money. And he supported his growing family. But the two of them were also very frugal. They just kept on setting aside a little money, a little money. And so when they settled in San Antonio, he was able to buy his own rig, and then he really began to make some money. And by the time the kids were heading towards college, 
He owned a fleet of trucks, which he ran out of the city. They had entered into their prosperity. It was a comfortable, it was a comfortable time. The kids joked that mom and dad loved their life so much that never wanted, they didn't, never wanted to leave their house even for a day. <laughs> but here they were headed to Graceland. Graceland. Well, they headed, they did, packed up the car and went. After seven days was over, they didn't come home. And Vicky called one of the called one of the, the daughters and said, Don't worry, honey. Which made her worry. <laughs> we decided to go on and and uh, go through Tennessee and get to Virginia and take a look what that's like. This was really something. The daughters were going, what has gotten into them? And then after a week or so, they called again. Don't worry. We've decided to look at uh, the, the northeastern seaboard. We've never been there. And so another week or so went away. Don't worry, honey. We've decided to go look at the plains. Of course, all that was precedent, you know. You know where they were headed, right? You do know where they were headed. Minnesota. They were going to Minnesota. It was late summer, time for the harvest. They went to Minnesota. Vicki went right to the older women and began cooking with them for the people and for the younger people who worked in the fields. Raphael jumped in the truck. They needed a truck driver, and he, he, took, he took the cotton and whatever else back and forth to the, to the co-op. They were rapturously happy. Rapturously happy. The seven days turned into seven months. They drove home and they were restored. They were reborn. They had really been to Graceland. Really. Graceland. Like Vicki and Raphael, if we really want to experience Christmas, we, we need to go on a journey of the heart to rediscover love's origins. Christmas, after all, is our spiritual anniversary. So we can take this time and make that journey. But we have to get in step behind Mary and Joseph. Much like Raphael and uh, Vicky's family, those two were moved around by, by forces beyond them with big names like Augustus and Quirinius. And so off they went from their comfortable, their comfortable home that they knew so well in Nazareth, in Galilee, and they make a 90-mile trek to the Judean hills, to Bethlehem. 90 miles when you're nine months pregnant. But with the forces calling the shots, moving people like chess pieces, where you just went. Whereas those forces have power, they cannot control the heart. And when a child is born to those two, to Mary and Joseph, the origin of their love begun, begins to just rise up to them. You see, in the child born, in, in Jesus Christ, we have the face of love. You know that, right? In Jesus Christ, we have the face. Now, notice I didn't say a, a face that we love. Every baby that's born <laughs> has a face who's, that their parents love. Okay? All three of our children, our three grandchildren, 
the, the moment, the moment I saw their face, I loved them. Of course I did. My mother even said she loved me when I was born. Hard to imagine. I was delivered with the forceps. I came out with a cone head, you know, and she thought I was gonna say, I am from France. Um, and my face was all black and blue. And they said it was a difficult delivery and they put, after they delivered me, they put, her up, put me up on my mother's stomach, my 18 year old mother's stomach. And she said, Pat, I thought you were the most beautiful creature on earth. <laughs> Now that's love. <laughs> but I didn't say that Jesus has a face that we love. I said he's the face of love. God the Father who creates everything out of love. Everything. Creates all the critters. Creates the, he creates all the environment around us that we love so much. If you have a hill country place, he created every molecule of that. He created every person whom you love. And he created them out of love for you. He created them out of love for you. That God is born to Mary and cared for by Joseph and Mary. That's who's born. He is the face of love. He is the one who when he, uh, after he gets finished, fretting and wetting and crying through the night and keeping his parents up. And you'll hear a song about that after I preach written by our, our, uh, our, our pianist, Barry Brake. Uh, you know, Jesus was a kid. He was just a baby driving his parents nuts. Um, but when he grows up, he begins to speak in love. And people, people when they hear him, when they hear him, it's like the Bible comes to life. He, he speaks. He speaks the truth, the deepest truths of, of God the Father. And, and then he, he, he heals in love, and he, and he casts demons out from people that have been deviling them and, and constrained them, casts them out, all out of love, all out of love. But ultimately, he acts in love. He walks to Calvary resolutely and is crucified, showing us how far love will go. Showing us how far God's love will go. In the messages, of course, God's love will go farther than we can imagine. That's how far it'll go. He is the face of love. You know, in this tradition, in the Episcopal tradition, we always say the Nicene Creed when, we're, when we have Holy Communion, which is all the time. And you may say, golly, not that again, you know. People have been saying it every, you know, every time we worship since the fourth century. But there's a part in the Nicene Creed that goes like this. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit to be born of the Virgin Mary and became man, okay? For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate, he became flesh of the Virgin Mary and was made man. That is a profound, that is a profound statement. And what we're saying is the great love story with God begins then. With, with Christ, it begins then. And that's why uh, when we come to that part of the creed, you always see me make a profound bow because it's awesome to think that God would do that. To most of the world, the fact that God becomes a human being, a squirming, whining, wetting child is scandalous. It's scandalous to most of the world. But for Christians, it is the crux of our faith. God knows us, he loves us, he has become one of us. And so with that, when we say that, I make a profound bow. And by the way, I don't bow saying, isn't that Jesus a good guy? When you bow like that in church, the symbol is you expose your neck to the king. And if he wants to take your life right then, he can do it. That's what that bow is all about. I bow, I bow to the face of love. It's a good night to ask who do you bow to?
I bow to the face of love. And, you know, as we look at the story of Mary and Joseph, and we look at the story of Vicki and Raphael, and it seems that there are forces beyond them that just seem to be calling the shots in their life. I mean, they are really moved along, I mean, by, by very powerful forces. And I know that many of you feel that way. I mean, you know, we're very fortunate in this congregation. We've got lots of young families, lots. I mean, you know, we're in, into procreation in a crazy way here, you know. Uh, and uh, it's really fun, all these babies and stuff. But when I talk to these young families, they are harried beyond, beyond, beyond belief. I don't remember Kay and me being quite that harried. I mean, it's true, I took care of most of the child care and everything, most of the cooking, but, you know. Uh, but, oh, she's up there, you know, give me a dirty look. But no, really, I mean, but I look, talk to these young families now, and, you know, they're, they're, they're both going this way and that way to work in order to make ends meet, and then they're trying to decide how, you know, do I balance this work commitment with, with sitting at dinner with my kids, and who's going to pick up the kids, and who's going to take them to the next, you know, you know, soccer match or something that's no not here in san antonio but it has to be you know in fort worth and and then we got social engagements we need to do and most of them need social secretaries for goodness sake. i got my lord have mercy my and i don't say this from just about the parish my oldest son and his wife clay will be 45 in may and his and his uh wife and their our three grandchildren were here this week it's the reason why i look a little harried um but um when, I, when they tell me about their life, I, I just, you know, I just can't, I go, wow. And, you know, when the grandkids come and stay with us, all they want to do is stay in their pajamas and play in the floor. I understand, you know. And if that's not enough, we have young people in the parish, you know, older teenagers and those 20-somethings. And they feel this tremendous pressure, this oppression, this anxiety. Not all of them, but enough of them. It really scares me. Scares me. They feel like they're just being kind of, just being, being taken along in a stream of which they, they can't control. And that, that's not good. It's also not true. And then you get to be my age, you get in the older group, and we just go from one doctor's appointment to the next. <laughs> It really came home to me. It really came home to me, you know, uh, in the last few weeks because in the Episcopal Church, we're very serious about pastoral care. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's big. And Scott and, and Karen Von Brugge lead that for us. And, we're, and they give me a list, a list of people to go take Holy Communion to. And they do the same thing for Brian, John, all of us. And, you know, I'd call people to make appointments. You know what the first thing I'd say? You know, and these are people that had to be homebound because of, illness or something or are they are they particularly susceptible to disease and the first thing all of them say when they call hey i'd like to bring the family you know a home communion let me check my doctor's appointments this week <laughs> you know it's like you're waiting on the next shoe to drop you know so i get it we we feel like we're being you know we feel as if we're being controlled by forces beyond us and i want to tell you tonight that you are not you are not controlled by those things. They have no power over you. Not really. They don't. They masquerade like they have power over you, but they do not have power over you. Here is, here is the truest statement I can tell you. St. John tells the story of the Incarnation this way. And this, um, listen to it, it's poignant. He, he says, to all who received him, who, all who received Jesus Christ, and believed in his name, he gave the power to be children of God, who were born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Wow. Folks, all of you who believe the Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ and have received him have been set free of all this other stuff. You have been set free from it. You have been given the power by Almighty God to claim the most important fact of your life that you're a child of God. You've been given that. Claim it. Doesn't mean you don't have to go to work tomorrow, but you know, or when you go, but, 
but you go as a child of God and nothing else can define you. There's no higher, by the way, there's no higher definition than that. None. Finally, sometimes it's good for us to be a little uncomfortable, don't you think? Don't you think sometimes? I mean, I think about Raphael and, and Vicky. They really were, just like so many of us, just ensconced. I mean, if it wasn't for my wife, I would, just, I would sit in my office and read books all the time. That's enough, Pat. We're going to go somewhere now, you know. But, you know, I'm the ultimate homebody. Uh, it's so interesting. We were supposed to go to Kenya, and, and it was second trip, and, and I, you know, I just didn't want to go. I mean, it, it just seemed so arduous to me. It had already been before. It's a tough journey. And then Ebola was coming in from Uganda and looked like it was going to cross, it was going to cross the border. And I said, honey, you know, um, maybe we should, you know, we, we should put this off. She looked at me, that, you know, all five foot four, but she looked me in the face. She said, we're going. And I said, uh, yes, ma'am, I think we are. It's like Vicky saying we're going to Graceland. And so uh, it's good for us to get uncomfortable. And that's what happens on a journey, right? You kind of leave the old, the old signpost behind and you, and you start off and you, and, you, and you begin to learn something about yourself. Now this doesn't have to be a geographical journey. It can be just a journey of the heart. But we need to get uncomfortable so we can hear God speak to us again. You see? We need to get a little uncomfortable so we can hear Him. We need to... We, it, and just doing the same old, same old just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You know, and tonight, you know, you'll go home and you'll take the, you know, the Christmas dinner and you'll kind of put it in the, I was going to say Tupperware, but that really kind of dates me. You're going to put it in the plastic containers and you kind of stack it up nicely in the refrigerator and, the, and your kids go to bed or your kids leave and go home. Uh, you turn off the Christmas lights and you say to yourself, is this all there is? Well, no. But it is a good time to look in the mirror and say, there's got to be more to me than this. There has to be more. And I'm going to tell you there is. There is more. Get uncomfortable. Leave the old signpost behind. Let God speak to you. I mean, think about those, think about the first people that ever came to Jesus. They were shepherds, right? Shepherds. And what does the scripture say in St. Luke? And there, was in that, there were in that region shepherds who were keeping their flocks by night. They knew how to do that. They were comfortable taking care of sheep at night. It wasn't such a bad job. Oh, God. Come on, show me the love, okay? Uh, all right. And so they're keeping their sheep by night. They were good at that. But all of a sudden, the angel appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. Terrified. They were terrified. And the angel says to them, Do not fear, for I bring you good tidings of great joy. For to you in the city of David is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so they leave the familiar and they come to Christ. Do they go back to shepherding? I'm sure they do. I bet you the neighbors in Bethlehem weren't too crazy about all those sheep running through the town. But anyway, but they, they go back to what they do, I'm sure, just like you'll go back to what you do. But you don't have to be the same. The pilgrimage of the Christian. Every Christian is on the same pilgrimage, and it is to become like the one who saves us. We are to become like Jesus. Oh, fallible, not quite like him, but our whole, our whole life is becoming more like him. Yeah. It's what it's like. It's what it's for. Tonight I want to give you a word of hope. I want you to know that tonight the face of love is appearing to you and me. I want you to be absolutely confident that, that no power on this earth, economic or municipal or whatever, social has has any ultimate power over you. Only the face of love has power over you, and He only wills your good. And get a little uncomfortable. Don't enter the new year just a little bit uncomfortable. And let God speak into your life. Let the face of love confront you so that you become more than you are. And then... 
if that happens, you will have gone to Graceland.